including this fragment of a column that would have been around the tomb of the pharaoh. Down here, we see the pharaoh's name, meant to Hotep II. This proclaims that he will live forever. Uh, the best thing, certainly the biggest, is over here. Now, not the uh, wonderful rhinoceros head, that is tremendous, but what the head is sitting on, this massive granite altar, again 4,000 years old from Deir al-Bari, and on it are 18 versions, the name of the pharaoh, meant to Hotep II. It is absolutely tremendous. Here, objects were offered to the gods and also to his spirit to sustain him in the afterlife. But it was Lord Dufferin's present life that really needed sustaining, particularly his finances. His saviour came in the shape of British imperial power. With over 50 colonies in six continents by the 1860s, the empire was growing at an ever-increasing pace. There were foreign postings aplenty now, and Lord Dufferin's trip to Egypt was opening up more opportunities than just the collection of curios. Lord Dufferin returned from the Middle East, a man of the world, with direct experience of foreign travel and of Arab culture. So, in 1860, he was a natural choice when the British government wanted to send a representative to Syria. Syria was important to the empire because of its trade routes. Whilst there, Lord Dufferin proved himself to be a brilliant negotiator, managing to avert a civil war. At last, he'd found his calling, and most importantly, a regular paycheck. In demand back home, he was offered plum jobs in their India office, then the war office. Yet he was still in need of a fortune. But he was soon to be in possession of a wife. In 1862, Lord Dufferin, then aged 36, married Harriet Rowan Hamilton. This um, wonderful watercolour captures the moment. They got married at the church nearby, and after the marriage ceremony, arrived at Clanderboy House for the reception. And here we see Lord Dufferin and Harriet, with the great veil over her, arriving through that door over there. This is an amazing image. One can exactly place the scene that took place then in the, the gallery today. A lot of the paintings and other objects shown in this watercolour are still in the house, not necessarily in the same place, except um, here we see these wonderful curving narwhal tusks. There they are, still in place at the bottom of the staircase. An incredible scene, and one can imagine the reception was a great success, very lavish much enjoyed by all. It wasn't just Lord Dufferin who was going up in the world. His debts were too. In 1864, he had to take out a mortgage for £21,000 to keep himself afloat. But his debt didn't stop him hiring yet another fashionable architect, this time the London-based Benjamin Ferry. His brief to design a gothic clander boy. A gothic fantasy, as it turned out, because, of course, Lord Dufferin couldn't afford to build it. So, what next? He dismissed Ferry and hired another architect, one William Lynn. This time, clander boy was to be recast in French chateau style which also wasn't built. But that turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Lord Dufferin decided to continue a less expensive scheme. He started as long ago as 1869, when he turned the kitchens here at the back of the house into a new entrance hall. This was, of course, the cheap solution, but as it happened, also architecturally inspired. inspired because it gave him a home for his curios, but also because it allowed him to display them in a very special way. 
I believe Lord Dufferin was echoing aloud of the ancient tombs and temples he'd seen in Egypt, particularly the one he'd excavated at Deir al-Bari. In those temples, the journey starts down there, the world of man, and rises to the world of the gods. The visual termination of this route through the house, the focus of this almost spiritual journey, was the statue of the great Egyptian god Amun. He stood just up here. Lord Dufferin had acquired the statue in Egypt, and um, clearly it was an inspirational object. Amun was here, but has now been replaced by this wonderful image of the Buddha, who now presides over all who enter the house. Alas, a moon was sold in 1937, but given the state of Lord Dufferin's finances, it's lucky to have clung on for so long. By 1872, Lord Dufferin owed £300,000. That's around £20 million at today's figures. Of course, a colossal sum. So what was to be done? Well, he decided at that point he had to sell some land. It must have been heartbreaking. So land he'd inherited, land he hoped to pass on to his descendants. But to sort of sugar the pill, he decided he'd sell this land to um, other aristocratic landowners. He looked around, find they were in the same position as he was. Not much money. Um, so then, he was forced to do something I suppose he found rather distasteful. It was to turn to the, uh, the nouveau riche for funds. The only nouveau riche in mid-Victorian Belfast were industrialists. They'd grown fat on the fruits of the empire, manufacturing ships, linen and rope. While most of the old landed families were now broke, crushed by agricultural decline. Ballywater Park is owned by Lord Dunleith. His ancestor, Andrew Mulholland, was a linen merchant Lord Dufferin turned to in his financial hour of need. The Mulholland lent him so much money, almost five million pounds to us, that they became known as Clanderboy's bankers. Today. I'm, I'm sorry about the weather, couldn't do anything about it. It's truly <laughs> grim, but let's go on inside. Yes, yes, it yes, might be a bit warmer inside. Yes, thank you very much. I think we were really fairly sort of basic family living off the land, and then um, Andrew Mulholland's father um, sort of started up in a small way as a businessman in Belfast. And um, as we all know, in the uh, early to mid-19th century, um, it was a time for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, and if they, they, they found a niche somewhere, it was a, a means of getting very wealthy very quickly. This is called the key point, isn't it? Um, the the, the generalisation about Ireland at that period is, is poor because of the agricultural depression and so on. But Belfast is different, isn't it? It is, it is more like Manchester, Liverpool. It's an industrial centre. Absolutely. It had the largest shipyards in the world the largest rope works yeah. in the world, the biggest tobacco factory in the world, and this is where we, where we come in, the, the largest, well, first of all, cotton mills, which were then rebuilt as linen mills. By tradition, your family is said to be the, the, the bankers for, for Lord Dufferin. He, 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 he was strapped for, for cash. And then, I mean, what, what happened? I mean, he, he, he approached your, 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 your great, great Yes, I, he, he certainly approached um, uh, the, the family and um, negotiated a, a loan of money. Um, land would have been pledged against the value of the, um, of the loan. And um, I guess um, when Lord Dufferin was unable to, to repay it for whatever reason, um, some form of foreclosure uh, took place. By the end of the decade, Lord Dufferin has sold off 12,000 acres. That's two thirds of his estate. All of it went to the new industrialists. Soon, was facing the unthinkable, selling Clanderboy House itself. Then, in 1872, came salvation. Despite having managed his own finances in such a bizarre way, Lord Dufferin was given management of Canada. He became the third Governor General. This prestigious post brought him in a handy £10,000 a year, plus expenses. 
Money was, for Lord Duffin, when in Canada, a very big issue. He believed that it was part of the Governor General's job to entertain generously. That's how one won friends. And certainly the French Canadians loved Lord Dufferin for his generosity, his style, his civilization, his parties. But of course, this could be a very expensive business. Here I have a little document which says that in those years, 1873 to 1878, Lord Dufferin entertained through dinners, lunches, balls, theatricals, 35,838 people, an incredible number. Given this astonishing largesse, it's not surprising to find out how Lord Dufferin was commemorated by the Canadians. I mean, Lord Dufferin was so successful in Canada that he, in fact, look at this, he was commemorated on the money of Canada, not Queen Victoria, but there we see Lord Dufferin Dominion of Canada. He's on the, the $2 bill, and his wife, Harriet, Lady Dufferin, is on the $1 bill. There she is. It's absolutely sensational. Of course, Lord Dufferin won recognition for more than being a generous host. He was also a highly effective negotiator. Lord Dufferin inherited the aftermath of a rather serious rebellion, which was between them. Um, mixed-race people, mixed-race French-Canadian and Native Americans who really didn't want to be part of the British Empire. And this is a fascinating, I think, I discover here. Um, indeed, a cartoon relating to this very time. Uh, what happened is that um, Dutherin had to display tremendous diplomatic skills to smooth out the relationship between the French-Canadians and the English, Scottish and Irish conflict, Catholics, Protestants, and so on. Very difficult for him. And um, during this sort of um, time of diplomacy, soothing the, the, the aftermath of rebellion, he, he got the reputation of a man with a, the wisdom of Solomon. That's what this cartoon shows him, presiding over tricky judgments and getting it right, helping to unite the nations. Lord Dufferin never stopped sending back treasures from far-flung lands. In 1879, he was made ambassador to Russia. Then, he moved on to Turkey. He was hailed as one of the greatest diplomats of his generation and became an increasingly important figure in Queen Victoria's empire and her affections. We have here something utterly wonderful. Letters from Queen Victoria to Lord Dufferin. Here we see um, a volume of them from Balmoral Castle, um, 1884, from the Queen to Lord Dufferin. Incredible, 1884, but still with his black mourning remembrance of Albert, who'd been dead over 20 years. But her writing um, is appalling, worse than mine, because there are transcripts I've got to my left here. So that letter, the Queen must now thank Lord Dufferin for his extremely kind letters. It does her good when her lonely, sad life deprived more and more of friends and helps and when she sees that people feel for her and are sorry for her. So that's what the Queen says to Dufferin. He's obviously very important in her life. And she was important in his. Lord Dufferin's closeness to the Queen was to help him climb to the very top. Finally, in 1884, Lord Dufferin got the job he has long wanted. At the age of 58, he was made Viceroy of India. The Viceroy was a representative of the Queen Empress in what was Britain's most valuable imperial possession. India was Britain's biggest market for manufactured goods and the source of invaluable raw materials, such as cotton. By the end of the 19th century, Britain was economically dependent on the Raj, making Lord Dufferin's position there as Viceroy crucial. And with this huge responsibility came lots of curios to ship back to Clanderboy, including a tiger skin and possibly the blade that skinned it. 
These Indian weapons Lord Dufferin collected possess a sinister beauty. Look at this sword. 